dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Hey friends, this is Mother Natalia, and today is actually my episode. I have on one of the other nuns, Mother Petra, and we are talking about what it is to experience an ache for beauty and what the Lord is asking us to do with that ache. We talk a lot about C.S. Lewis, one of our favorite authors, uh, but we bring in a little bit of an Eastern perspective as well a couple of times. And at the end, we cover a mini topic from one of our patrons, Father Joe. So we can, um, yeah, you can look forward to hearing about what it's like to pray with different types of religious art, both uh, statues and paintings and icons and all of that. So if you are a hashtag banter hater, this episode is for you because Mother Petra is also a hashtag banter hater. So we just skipped it. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to him forever. I'm like, you know the response to I didn't know what you were waiting for me. <laughs> um, welcome, Mother Petra. This Thanks. is this is a new a new voice on our podcast. This is also only the second time I've used this recorder uh, without Father Michael, and so the first time was with Rachel Rachel Schmidt, and I don't really know what I'm doing, and I don't know if I'm at the right volumes. I don't know how to. I don't know if everyone can hear the clock in the background that I can hear uh, or anything like that. So our listeners are always very patient and very gracious with us. So. I thank you all for that. Um, well, because I know that you, Mother Petra, um, are very much a banter hater, uh, <laughs> um, we are going to skip banter on this episode because we usually have a few minutes of banter at the beginning. And now all your listeners are going to be angry at me. <laughs> um, they're not You're banter lovers. We usually we usually give a um, a. Um, at the beginning, we give like a little intro, and it tells people a timestamp for the banter, so that so that those who don't like it can uh, can skip it. And it's very inclusive of you. Yeah, I think so. Um, most people, the the banter haters are the the loud minority, but uh, that's not true. We have a lot of people who reach out and they're like, "I love the banter, don't stop." But we are instead just going to um, introduce you. So. Uh, there's not there's not much that I wanted to say, I guess, because if people really want to hear your whole um, conversion story, they can watch your interview on the, what's it, the Coming Home Network? Is that what it's called? Um, it's their show, The Journey Home. The Journey Home. Uh, sorry, I always get that wrong. So, um, Mother Petra is giving me a mean mug right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you want to hear Mother Petra's conversion story, which is absolutely incredible, you can, uh, you can watch that. How do they... How do they find that? Do you know? I don't. I mean... Google? Google. Okay. Um, and, yeah. So, I think mostly what I want to focus on in introducing you is uh, a little bit about our relationship. Mm-hmm. Because I think that uh, our listeners know me. They know Father Michael. But uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our, our relationship. The unlikeliness of our relationship. Yeah. You know, actually, I often I often think of you. I hadn't thought to mention this, so I'm glad you said that. When people ask me what the, like, what the greatest gift is of, of being a nun, I, I don't know, like, the greatest gifts. As you know, I get really stressed out when people ask questions that include absolutes. Superlatives. Yeah, yeah. superlatives, that's the word. Um, but I, one of the greatest gifts of being a nun, being in community, is that you're kind of forced to, forced isn't the right word because you choose it, right? But, like, your choice then follows <laughs> with um, something of a forcing to, like, build a relationship with people Mm -hmm. that in the world in your natural course of life you just wouldn't have encountered and the reason I say that's a great gift is because um like you and I would have never crossed paths in the world no are never we have completely different personalities we studied totally different things like if we were at the same party we probably wouldn't even talk to each other absolutely not so thank god the lord forced us yes because we have a very beautiful relationship Mm -hmm. and and I connect with you 
on levels and about things that I don't connect um, Mm -hmm. with the other nuns with. So often I'll read something and be like, I think you would really appreciate this, Mm -hmm. but there may not be another sister here who would. Yeah. Yeah. So that really is a great gift. And I, I think of also uh, you, you and I both love C.S. Lewis. We're going to talk a lot about C.S. Lewis in this episode, but uh, you could say it better than me, I'm sure. But the this concept that he talks about of like the beauty of having inclusive relationships is that friend A and friend B only see mm-hmm. one another um, as they are with one another. And then when you introduce friend C into the equation, friend C brings out qualities of friend A that friend B has never seen yeah, before. Yeah. Is that pretty much? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Um, and so I was thinking of like some of the things that you really bring out in me that, uh, that other people don't as much. And, uh, three or four things came to mind. One is like, you and I really have this great sense of adventure together. Getting lost in the woods. <laughs> and yes. the team degree weather for three hours. Yeah. I was thinking that, yeah, we went on this hike that was supposed to be like <laughs> a mile or something. <laughs> We get completely turned around. Neither of us has a compass. This is like across the street from our house. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just in the woods. Um, We're with Mother Ileana as well. And, um, oh my gosh. And then it ends up being, it was really fun because I was wearing my Garmin watch. So it like tracked our route. And when I looked at the map afterwards, I saw what we were planning to do. And I also saw, like, all of the zigzags and the, like, going in circles and stuff that we had actually done. And we ended up going, I don't know, probably, like, oh, we were just five like, miles no, instead of the okay. one. Yeah, it was so fun. Uh, cliff jumping. Mm-hmm. That was so intense. If you can climb anything, that's what we'll do. <laughs> yes, all of that. Um, and that's, like, a natural part of me. I'm a very adventurous person. But I, like, you very much bring it out. You know, I was saying the other day, too, that... Um, you bring out a gentleness in me that I think other people, like, I just desire to be gentler with you. And so it just, it just comes out. Um, and then my sense of humor is like, I think it's like, I know that I'm going to have to try hard to get a laugh out of you. Because I'm laughing inside. (laughs) Uh So you're not just going to give me a pity laugh. And so I think because of that, it's like I take the challenge and I run with it. And I'm so much wittier when I'm (laughs) around you (laughs) because I'm like, I will make. And then once I get you going, I just don't want to stop. But then particularly... Something that's been fostered in my life since knowing you is my love of literature. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved literature. Uh, You know, growing up, I would like bring a book with me everywhere I went. When we're, when my parents were driving, I'd be in the backseat reading, which is terrible because I get car sick. And I would take the book into the restaurant whenever my parents would let me. And so while we're waiting for our food, I'm reading. It was actually very antisocial. It's not okay to encourage parents to let their kids do this, but I did it because my parents, I, I'm sure I would have thrown a fit if they didn't. And so, like, I've always loved reading, but you've helped me to really dive into that and, um, and to explore that love. And, um, yeah, it's just been, I guess, deepened, you know, what was, what was, a natural love, I think you've really helped foster into something that's supernatural and that's become a place of encounter with the Lord. And our listeners have experienced the fruit of that because I'm constantly talking about mm-hmm. different novels that I'm reading or different spiritual works or, or whatever. Well, um, that's been mutual too. I remember when I was at Docomos and you had mailed to me Fahrenheit 451, mm-hmm. which I like love dystopic futures. Mm-hmm. Um, just like love them never even heard of this one which what is it about but like the the subversiveness of beauty and literature mm-hmm. so yeah um so <clears throat> why i asked for this particular topic for you mother petra because um you uh, i've had most of the other nuns on at this point and i've been kind of waiting for like the perfect topic for you and uh, we had a listener write in one of our um, one of our page patrons is what they're called Father Joe, and he requested a mini topic asking about praying with different types of religious art. Mm-hmm. So praying with um, yeah, I guess I don't have to 
I don't have to expand on that, just different types of religious art. Um, and when I got the request for that, I was like, well, <laughs> I don't really pray with different types of religious art because art is not one of the things that like moves me deeply. Usually there have been some exceptions, but for the most part, like that's not one of the things that deeply moves me, but I know it does you and Sister Nufria. Uh, mm -hmm. Sister Nufria studied art at the um, uh, Cleveland Art Institute. No, no, <laughs> That's no, not no. what it's called. Um, it's Cleveland State. <laughs> Cleveland State, thank you. <laughs> like, oh man, sorry, Sister Nufria. Uh, she doesn't know, she doesn't listen. I don't know, maybe she listens. Anyways, so I sat down with the two of you and I was like, hey, can you guys, you know, this is a five to 10 minute topic. I just want a couple of thoughts. And then... Um, you just had like a hundred thousand thoughts, uh, <laughs> and you were like, but I guess, I don't know, maybe it doesn't make sense for you to share that because it doesn't really make sense for you because it's more my perspective. And I was like, great, why don't you come on? <laughs> um, but you had so much to share and it was so beautiful that I was like, I want to do a whole episode on this. I don't want it to just be a mini topic. So, uh, you're welcome, Father Joe. But I, I really think at the end, we'll talk about that specific question of praying with different types of religious art, mm -hmm. but I, I want us to cover more so like just what it is to pray with beauty mm -hmm. and what it is to encounter beauty and what it is to encounter the Lord in beauty um, and not just in religious art, but in secular art, especially like movies and literature mm -hmm. and, yeah. and these things that you and I so frequently bond over and and talk about you know we you and I in particular a lot of the nuns of the in our community are like this but you and I in particular we always want to make sure that like if we're going to schedule um time to watch a movie we want to schedule time afterwards to be able to unpack it and discuss yes. the things that it's like brought up in our hearts and we don't want to just read books and say I liked it it was good like we want to talk about um why, what why. Did it mean? yeah yeah um so I'd like to to talk about that a little bit and to start with that, I promise listeners who are getting sick of hearing my voice right now, I am going to let Mother Petra talk. Uh, I just want to share that something I've been praying a lot with recently um, that kind of came up on the healing retreat that we just had as a community is starting to pay better attention to my desires and my attractions um, because our desires and our attractions at the deepest level are good things. Mm -hmm. And um, Evagrius, the solitary Evagrius of Pontus, um, talks about this, how, like, ultimately our desires are good. The devil can twist them and pervert them, and, um, and we can grasp at the good, which makes it no longer a good, and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, which we've talked a lot about on, on our podcast, but, um, but yeah, figuring out what that root desire is and what that root attraction is and, and where it's calling me to see the Lord. So I wanted to, um, to just have you share about your attraction to beauty mm -hmm. and, and where you kind of first noticed that mm -hmm. or, um, a striking experience of that or, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure where to start. I think when we're talking about praying with beauty, it's about being in touch because I don't just mean like, we're not, we're not talking about mere aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. It's not something that's just pleasing to the eye. Mm -hmm. It's something that's connected to your heart or your soul, if you will. Um, and so when it comes, it, it's like being attentive to the place in you that aches, mm -hmm. that aches for fulfillment. Um, and rather than, analyzing it or closing it off because the strength of that longing, um, that lack of satisfaction can be frightening mm -hmm. um, to lean into it, to like mm -hmm. follow the desire along its trajectory because it's pointing beyond itself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up being read to a lot. Um, I encountered a lot of my dad would read to me. I mean, he still does, frankly, but um, in story encountering, like, charm. I've been an Anglophile my whole life before I ever had an idea that that was a thing. 
um, studied English history to like understand the heartbeat behind um, some of that. Um, but really, I didn't have language for this. It was like, I, I was actually as a child, I think frightened mm -hmm. by, I had like this kind of schizophrenic, I want to run toward beauty, I'm so attracted to beauty. Um, but what it awakens in me could lead me to despair mm -hmm. because what if I'm just empty forever? What if it's never, the, this longing is never met? Um, I, uh, I remember when we lived in Fort Wayne, our church was in a little town called Leado. And, uh, so we would drive through rural Northern Indiana, like huge open fields, some forest copses of trees and maybe, I don't know, 11, 12 years old, um, a certain time of year when we would leave church on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, the sun would be setting mm -hmm. and it would be that gloaming tide where like there's the golden slanting light and everything's different. And I would be sitting in the back seat of the car and having those old woodchuck station wagons and looking out and not saying this, not expressing this to anybody, but feeling this like, since I didn't have this word, but like a mournful ache of exile in my heart. Mm. And what seems so incongruous is I would have this thought, when I grow up and fall in love, I'm going to come back here. Mm. That seems like to follow from nothing. Like, what does that have to do with anything? But looking back on my life, I see that in my little girl heart, I somehow intuitively knew that beauty had to do with union. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like romanticism or sentimentality. It was like at some fundamental level, I knew that this longing was for communion. And this longing was being awakened by this beauty of these fields, which still move me deeply. Um, now they immediately turn me to prayer. But at that time in my life, I didn't really understand what prayer was. So I grew up with this just thirst. We went to Colorado every year. Um, and so we would spend a couple weeks out there each summer in the, the ache, right? I would just sit in the back seat and cry and be horribly embarrassed of crying on when we would drive away from the mountains mm -hmm. back to Indiana. Um, and, and I, at the time I was thinking like, well, I just need to move here. Like that's what I'm longing for. Right. Um, but then when I was in high school, I finally read, um, Mere Christianity. Hmm. Jack has just been more formative for my mind than any other writer, probably. Um, my mind and my heart. He gave me language, finally, to understand what was happening inside of me. Um, for listeners who don't know, Jack is so, what C.S. Lewis's um, friends and family would call him. Um, so, in Mere Christianity, has this line that says, When I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy... The most logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Mm. And I can't explain the relief that I felt. Relief of there is a, I don't like the words that, a fulfillment. There mm -hmm. is a fulfillment. Um, I'm not doomed to this wandering in the wilderness forever. It was like a promise. But somehow my ache my thirst for beauty became evidence, if, if that's the right word, that the Lord was calling me to himself. Mm. It became evidence of his presence, of his existence. It's not that I really doubted his existence, but from then on, I could never deny it because I had this hole in my interior, like chasms of longing. Um, but they became, they, they like spoke to me of, of the promise of fulfillment. Um, so I started to like understand that longing more, press into that more. Um, as I went on, I mean, years later, The Weight of Glory, um, C.S. Lewis's essay he wrote in 1941, which is very interesting to me that like in the midst of World War I, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, World War II, what does he presume to speak of? Um, but like the weight of glory, what what the other person 
our eternal destiny, but that's tied up with this longing, right? Mm. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Sorry, this is kind of a side note, but I, I just thought of it as you were sharing that he's writing this in the midst of wartime. Um, St. John Paul II, very similarly, like mm-hmm. in the time of war, that's when he's like, we need to actually have more creativity. Mm-hmm. We need to have the the we need to have people writing. We need to have plays. We need to have these things. Mm-hmm. Like basically, we need to still remember beauty and mm-hmm. creativity and art in the midst of war. Because mm-hmm. if we lose those things, we lose some part of our humanity. Right. Um, so, anyways, so that's just I I hadn't thought of that before. But yeah, no, it's a beautiful parallel. Like we remember who we are, or we don't remember who we are mm-hmm. in the midst of war. Um, Can I read a section of it? Please, yeah. Mm. Now, if we are made for heaven, the desire for our proper place will be already in us, but not yet attached to the true object and will even appear as the rival of that object. If a trans-temporal, trans-finite good is our real destiny, then any other good on which our desire fixes must be in some degree fallacious must bear at best only a symbolical relation to what will truly satisfy. And speaking of this desire for our own far off country, which we find in ourselves even now, I feel a certain shyness. I am almost committing an indecency. I am trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in each one of you, the secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence. The secret also which pierces with such sweetness that when, in very intimate conversation, the mention of it becomes imminent, we grow awkward and affect to laugh at ourselves. The secret we both cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it, and we betray ourselves like lovers at the mention of a name. Our commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave as if that had settled the matter. Wordsworth's expedient was to identify it with certain moments in his past, but all this is a cheat. If Wordsworth had gone back to those moments in the past, he would not have found the thing itself, but only the reminder of it. What he remembered would turn out to be itself a remembering. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things... The beauty, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. Do you think I am trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am. But remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantment, as well as inducing them. And you and I have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness, which has been laid upon us for nearly a hundred years. And here we are 80 years later, right? (laughs) Even more in need of being woken up by beauty. Um, I've always thought when I was in the world, I was um, very blessed to count among my friends, um, several gay and lesbian individuals and I was always amazed that they're just like sensitivity and openness to beauty um I always feel like this is this is the back door open in every human heart no political agenda or polemic or um even like when we've been wounded and turned on by the church have that experience of being abused um nothing ever turns that off in Mm -hmm. us unless we go completely numb um and so it's like the Lord's sort of safeguarding that deepest place that speaks speaks to us of Him. Yeah, as, as you were reading, as you were reading the excerpt, I remembered something else that C.S. Lewis wrote uh, at the beginning of. So I I hadn't read Chronicles of Narnia until a few years ago, mm. um, 
which I remember you being very jealous at the time. You were jealous both when I was reading Chronicles of Narnia and when I was reading <laughs> The Lord of the Rings yeah. several years ago, um, because you were like, man, to be able to experience that for the first time again. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but You don't quite appreciate it as a child. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it has, yeah, different different ways of piercing as a child, I'm sure. But uh, But that's actually the point. So in the Chronicles of Narnia... At the beginning of, I don't know if it's at the beginning of all the books or whichever book that I started with, I don't know, but the C.S. Lewis had written a dedication Mm -hmm. and he was dedicating it to maybe a godchild or something. Lucy Barfield, Owen Barfield's, yes, it was his goddaughter. His goddaughter. Uh, and, And he says something in the dedication, I'm paraphrasing here, but something along the lines of, um, anyway, yeah, by the time I finish writing this book, you might be too old for fairy tales, mm-hmm. but one day you will be old enough again for fairy mm-hmm. tales. And and mm-hmm. I was like really struck by that. It's like we go through this period where we're embarrassed or something mm-hmm. by this this ache, and mm-hmm. we're we're embarrassed for the longing that happens when we yeah. hear these things and when we read these things and when we see these things uh, because we we think it's childish. Um, but I think it's actually childlike. I think it's part of what Jesus is talking about when he says you have to become like, mm-hmm. like a child to enter the kingdom. It's, you have to, you have to be open to the ache. You have to be open to the longing. You have to be open to the wonder, the sense of wonder that comes when you encounter beauty, when you encounter something, um, divine. Yeah. And so I was, I was thinking of that and I was, uh, yeah, just really, really moved by that because I I came to this conclusion or to this realization maybe like four years ago. Uh, I don't know. I have a terrible sense of time, but several years ago, I was trying to figure out whether or not a book that I was reading um, was like the book that I quote unquote should be reading Mm -hmm. because we can only read so many books. And I'm like, is this, uh, but whatever the book was, because I, I couldn't even, it wasn't even like, it didn't have particular parts or like phrases that I could pick out that, um, had some sort of profundity to them. But I just knew that when I was reading it, like my heart was cracked open Yes, and there was a longing that I was bringing to the Lord in prayer. And I didn't even necessarily know what was happening, but I was like, if this book is moving something in my heart to the Lord, then this is the book that I should be reading, yeah. right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, to be that attentive to the movements. Because sometimes it's not until the second or third time we read a book at a later time, like later point in our life that we can identify, if at all, what that thing is, mm-hmm. right? Um, but that's like bad books, they don't make you ache, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if one of the reasons there's this period perhaps where, where I don't know if you use the word embarrassed. I did, um, yeah. I, I wonder if part of that, he speaks of awkwardness, like, mm-hmm. is because it alienates us from our peers. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I never entered, I never went through a phase in which I didn't um, love, seek these things, but I did it in secret like Mm -hmm. I wouldn't you know you're surrounded by all of your girlfriends and they're all into like whatever they're into boy bands I don't know um and like (laughs) just like you're you're on the outside right um and so I wonder if sometimes we don't speak of these things or we set them aside if the motivation in each is we want to belong Mm -hmm. which we think is the answer to the longing and so we set them aside because we can't bear to be more alienated than we already are because we haven't yet accepted that we're strangers and exiles Mm -hmm. sojourners and exiles whatever like we're pilgrims in this world um and that's what beauty is constantly reinforcing but just like encountering that that line in mere christianity um the gospel is like giving meaning to that sense of alienation it's Mm -hmm. not just a doom laid on you um, it's speaking the truth of our situation in the universe, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Which C.S. Lewis just so amazingly captures. Like everything I read of C.S. Lewis, it just, uh, I didn't love his reflections on the Psalms, if I'm going to be honest. But I just read that for the first time and I did love it. I keep thinking oh, about good. it. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Um, 
it's different. Uh-huh. Like, it's more along the lines of his literary criticism, yeah. which is not riveting. <laughs> I mean, it's helpful, but, um, yeah. Um, that's really funny. But, uh, but yeah, just the way that he can, can capture these, these big experiences that everyone has, but you feel like you're the only one who has them. Mm-hmm. And then he just capital, he like names them and captures them and, um, what you too? <laughs> you yeah. Have one of those moments you speak. Yeah, of, yeah. It's amazing. Um, it's kind of like reading Michael D. O'Brien and mm. realizing that, um, Oh, maybe I do actually hear the Lord because <laughs> what he's writing about in like this character who's hearing the Lord, like that's exactly what my, yeah. yeah anyways, it's just, this, yeah. If you want to talk about beauty, um, his books, like I don't understand yeah. how he can write about celibacy and marriage with both of them being so like credible isn't the right word. Like, I feel like he captures the experience of the celibate, yeah. but he's a, a married father, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how does he do this? Yeah, um, I have no idea. Yeah, it's just, wow, his beauty. Yeah. Um, so I do want to talk about some of the some of the different places of seeing beauty because um, you and I have talked already a little bit about literature. Um, and this was even, like, one of our very first, um, I think, moments of just, like, bonding was mm-hmm. talking about Jane Eyre. Um, yeah. yeah. Mother Petra is pointing to outside right now. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. you were on observership at that point? No, it was May. It was I was even just before observership. here for the day okay. and we were sitting out on lawn chairs yeah. out front. Because yeah. Jane Eyre has been a favorite book of both of ours mm-hmm. for, it's been my favorite book since probably seventh grade. That's um, funny. You read it for me. I read it in eighth grade. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think seventh. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to a seventh grader. Um, um, I was now, Protestant, but, so I'm like, why doesn't he just divorce his mad wife? Now I'm horrified at my little self, but I didn't. Know. <laughs> my dad tried to explain why. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's just like Jane Eyre. Um, actually, yeah, one of the one of the most beautiful gifts I've received at the monastery, um, as in like a material gift, uh, was Mother Petra had made for me for Christmas several years ago. Um, was it for Christmas? I think it was for Christmas. Christmas. Um, she took my favorite passage from Jane Eyre and distressed it in like coffee or something. Tore the page of the book, yeah. And then framed it, but also like matted it and wrote part of the quote out, um, around the anyways it's just real beautiful so that's hanging in my hanging in my cell but um so there's definitely literature uh but I I want to mention I think I just want to mention some different things because like I said art is not one of the things that typically moves me deeply Mm -hmm. there are some pieces of art that just like pierce my heart but for the most part that's not the the thing for me and so I do want to mention some other um, places that I know a lot of people are pierced by beauty. Some of them are my own because, um, yeah, I don't want people to think like, well, literature doesn't really resonate with me. And so maybe I'm, um, maybe I'm deficient and I can't (laughs) drink beauty. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, so a few others that I had thought of were, um, I mean, people is a big one. Like I remember Father Michael saying to me at one point, uh, I've maybe even mentioned this on the podcast before, but he's just like, Mother Natalia, literally Mother Natalia, as in I'm already a nun at this point. He's like, you fall in love so quickly and so easily. And I was like, I know. <laughs> um, but it's sincere. It like, is, and it's not even, like, sometimes they're, um, you know, bodily, physical people, but mm-hmm. you fall in love with the sense of somebody's spirit. Yes, like, absolutely. Their gentleness, their, their vulnerability, their cheer whatever it is Mm -hmm. um I think I've learned that from you a little bit um at night my first question in my exam and every night is what was beautiful today Mm -hmm. father Patrick instituted that years ago when he was my director and um so, so like it helps me throughout the day be attentive but there's days when I'm just like Jesus, I've got nothing. Father, (laughs) like, I was inside all day. I was doing this work. Like, I don't know. And it's beautiful because then I have to say, Father, you tell me what was beautiful today. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't see any nature. I didn't read anything. I didn't hear music. Like, whatever. Um, But almost without fail, what he brings to my mind 
in those moments is an interaction, Mm -hmm. often with you, actually. Whoa. (laughs) Um, Like, it's the beauty of somebody's heart revealed, Mm -hmm. softened, offered um, a vulnerability that, like, has nothing to do with exterior beauty. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that, like, the Lord's taught me that through this exercise each night. Um, But I've learned to see that more through how captivated you are Mm. um, after conversations um, that you have with people, whether in the grocery store. Yeah. Um, Thank you. That's, I didn't know that. Um, And, you know, and I think it's part of it is like, I, um, I'm not melancholic, right? I'm definitely a choleric sanguine or sanguine choleric I don't know one of those two but um uh but when you take the temperaments test like you always get parts of some of the different temperaments right like Mm -hmm. there's like some part of me that is melancholic and I think the part of me that is most melancholic is I feel very deeply Mm -hmm. um and I love very deeply and um and and beauty hurts my heart very deeply Mm -hmm. in like the most wonderful way um but uh people are definitely a um, a place in which beauty can absolutely be seen. Literature. You just mentioned nature. You know, like you and I both love the mountains. Mm-hmm. I was I was thinking as you were talking about the, actually as you were reading the quote, the weight of glory quote, um, and also talking about this concept of exile. I was thinking of I had a retreat um, after I'd been at the monastery for maybe a year and. Um, and I remember on that retreat, just finally letting out so much anger with the Lord for, I'm sorry, Ohio listeners, but for calling me to Ohio, because I'm like, Mm -hmm. I love Colorado. I love Colorado and I miss the mountains and it's not just this superficial thing. I see the mountains and I encounter you. I'm in the mountains and I encounter you. And why would you call me away from that? Mm -hmm. And I was so angry and, um, and at some point, he spoke to me, the Lord, um, and I realized the gift that I think in the mountains, I could be tricked into thinking that I'd found my home. Mm. Um, and he wants it. He wants to be clear with me that nothing on this earth is my home, like that I am in exile, like that I am a sojourner. Like you go to the desert and yeah. be in the mountains. Yeah. My parents had a mug once that said, if you're lucky enough to be in the mountains, you're lucky enough. Um, we want to know, like the Lord wants us to know what we lack. Yeah. yeah. Um, so nature, uh, I know autumn is a great love for you. Oh, the leaves make my heart stop, especially this year. It's been such it's a good a- year for the leaves. Wow. <laughs> Fall is the redeeming quality of Ohio. Now that I've bashed oh, Ohio, it's oh. beautiful. <laughs> um, Colorado does not have these deciduous trees. Like yeah. they have the aspens, they're flames, they're gorgeous, but they are not this. Yeah. Oh. Um, and uh, movies. Yeah. Like film. Yes. Yes. We used to go on dates with, like, go to movies by myself uh-huh. with the Lord and just, like, talk to him about what that opened up, right? Mm hmm. When, when we, when we, you know, I've talked many times on the podcast about Star Trek and typically when I'm, when I'm talking about Star Trek, I'm sharing something of like how it led to this revelation in prayer or something like that. You know, it's it's not actually about relationship. That makes so much sense for you because why you and I love Star Trek, it's Mm -hmm. not the sciencey stuff. It's the relational stuff Mm -hmm. because it follows these seven ish characters. And so it's those moments like it's all of those philosophical issues being worked out in the context of these relationships. Yeah. What is what is the episode? It, there's an episode. It might be a two-parter, but it basically just completely Which series? captures um, uh, um, Voyager. It completely captures monastic life and um, demonic attack. The one where they're doing the it's experiments. The one they're doing all the experiments. Yeah. What's that called? Uh one of our Invisible. listeners who's a Trekkie is going yeah. to reach out and tell us. They're but like it's drilling like drilling things into yes. their heads and keeping them from having sleep. But and, they're but they're invisible. Yeah. And so um 
they, I mean, they're invisible because of like technology, technology not, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm just like, we had so much to share with each other after that episode, because it's like, this is the monastic life. This is what the demons are doing to us. This they're is how he's getting down. us to turn on one another. This yeah. is how like your sister snaps at you, but you don't know that she's having this affliction by the demons. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, so it's really powerful. Um, and yeah. Do you want to do you want to mention the um, the book that you got in college? I know you know I have. Talked yeah. About that before. So in one of our conversations leading up to this, um, we were talking about different quotes about beauty. And um, in college, a dear friend gave me a book and inscribed the cover with the quote from um, "Till We Have Faces." Mm-hmm. And another C.S. Lewis book. <laughs> yeah. It's this line um, in which Psyche says she's trying to explain to her sister why she wants to go to the mountains to be devoured by the god as their myth thinks this is going to happen. It's a retelling of a Greek myth. Um, and, and the line is, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the search to find the place where all the beauty comes from. Mm. And I felt very seen when this was inscribed in the book um, because that kind of, it, it totally captures my life. Um, like, our entire existence is the search to find the place where all the beauty came from. Mm -hmm. And that place is the Trinity. And that's not some like doctrinal statement. It's not some mystical thing. Like all beauty that we encounter is emanating from the heart of the Trinity. And we enter into that on some level now in eternity. Um, And so like I had that up on my mirror for a long time, like, that's the sweetest thing. Mm-hmm. And then we have to remember it's sweet because it's also excruciating, right? Mm. Um, so, like, yeah, that I, that's what monasticism is, but that's what the Christian life is, the search to find the place where all the beauty came from. Yeah, I love it. Um, which is just, like, we have these transcendentals, the, the true, the good, and the beautiful um, that we're aching for, that we desire to receive, that we're seeking out um, and that's all around us. And, and it's just kind of heartbreaking that so often in Christianity, like we can try to shove down the beauty. Like mm-hmm. we think that um, it's, it's not good or something. Yeah. yeah um, and because what is good, you know, it reminds me. So, so we, um, I did an episode one time on, so I called it something like love the giver, not the gift or something like that. But it was inspired by a homily that Father Jan gave here at some point. Um, and it's just this, it, it reminds me of what C.S. Lewis uh, in The Four Loves talks about how um, the things, the loves that are closest to being divine Mm -hmm. are the ones that we're tempted to make into gods. Mm -hmm. It's not the, it's not the more like trashy things. It's not the more, um, base enjoyments that we Mm -hmm. try to turn into gods. It really is the ones that seem most like God are the ones that it makes the most sense for us to accidentally turn into gods. And so I think that's part of why, beauty is so scary for us like we're we're afraid that we're going to like get stuck on the the um yeah the gift or the the icon and yeah yeah, exactly it's like a a puritanical um element Mm -hmm. left over um or even like this gnosticism of like the body is bad Mm -hmm. and because we encounter beauty through the body it must be bad um which is not the gospel. It's not Christianity. God took on flesh. And I'm sure Jesus was beautiful, right? Right. When we were in Galilee, like, he was surrounded by this beauty, mm-hmm. even as he was surrounded by immense human suffering. Um, he goes away into the wilderness mm-hmm. to commune with his father overlooking the sea. Like, um, but we have still imbibed this falsity, um, that it's a threat. Mm-hmm. Um, Which... <laughs> In in defense of that, like, 
part of the reason we see it as a threat is because how many times in our life have we succumbed to that temptation, right? Like how many times have we actually grasped at the beauty and tried to possess and tried to, you know, I've talked a lot about that on this podcast is this like this, this grasping at instead of receiving and this trying to close our hands on trying to possess um, what's not ours to possess. And um, you know, there's this, this quote from, this amazing book, um, Beginning to Pray by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. Have you read this, Mother Petra? I haven't. I'm it's ashamed ashamed to say really haven't. good. Um, it's really, really good. But he's talking about, uh, he's well, he's talking about poverty, actually, in this section. But he says um, that, in a way, it's actually much easier to be poor inwardly. Um, sorry, it's much easier to be poor outwardly than to be poor inwardly, to have no attachments. He says, if you learn to be poor inwardly, he says, you really learn to value things, to look at people and see the radiant beauty which they possess without the desire to possess them. To pluck a flower means to take possession of it, and it also means to kill it. The vow of poverty makes me appreciate things much more. Um, and then, you know, he he also says later... Uh, in the book. Let me see if I can find it quickly. He says later in the book, um, the moment we try to be rich by keeping something safely in our hands, we are the losers. Because as long as we have nothing in our hands, Mm -hmm. we can take, leave, do whatever we want. This is the kingdom, the sense that we are free from possession. And this freedom establishes us in a relationship where everything is love human love and love divine. Um, it's like he doesn't, we, he, he's explaining like, we want to be in control of the consolation and the mm-hmm. beauty. We want to be self-sufficient. Like to possess is to control. We want to be able to like manipulate where we find it. I, as you were reading that, I was thinking of that line, the professor tells the, P- the Pevensey children this, I think, at the end of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he says, well, you'll never get back into Narnia by the same door twice. Mm. Um, there were times in my life when I would have this really a- acute mm. experience of God, and I would go back to the same place, I would try to replicate it, mm-hmm. and there was no sweetness because the consolation wasn't in that place, that song, that whatever it was. It's why um, Weight of Glory. It's exactly to that. Mm-hmm. It was a gift given. And a gift given, we have to receive and then let it go away again. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so, like, when we grasp it, we poison it, and we actually close off our capacity to receive new consolations. Like, we can't keep trying to go through the— well, we can keep trying to go through the same door, but it won't lead us into Narnia again. Yeah. Um, one of our priest friends— talks about that he says um never try to repeat the same consolation or something do you know what i'm talking about no okay that's okay um it 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 reminds me though of a poem when we were talking about this beforehand um and you were talking about just the ache and the fear that comes with it i remembered a poem that i wrote um let's see four years ago called the whisper um it's a pretty vulnerable poem so (laughs) thankfully our listeners are always um so gentle with my vulnerability uh so I'm going to share it um but it captures both I think the um I always give the disclaimer like I'm not a poet in the sense of like my poetry doesn't have um literary value but it has the value of a spiritual value. yeah um which is what the biographer of elizabeth of the trinity mm-hmm. said which gave me a great consolation when i when i read that is like that her poetry they said is uh not of much literary value but it, it conveys a spiritual reality mm-hmm. um so anyways it captures this idea of like the ache can be scary and why it can be scary. And I think that's both because there's a fear that it won't be fulfilled. And also because there's the fear that I'm going to abuse the beauty as I have in the past. Mm. Um, So it's called the whisper. There is a sadness that pervades every joy I've yet had. The sadness that comes from knowing this joy is not enough or it won't last or there are those without it. 
There is an ache that pervades every pleasure I've yet felt. The ache that comes from feeling, I want more, or I can't stop, or this soon will end. Mm -hmm. There is a fear that pervades every love I've yet known. The fear that comes from seeing that love can hurt, and when it's false, it's all but beautiful. There is a lie that pervades every truth I've yet heard. The lie that screams, I'm not enough, or I can't stop, or I'm all but beautiful. But a whisper pervades every sadness, every ache, fear, and lie. A voice that says so gently that I delight, and in my fearless ache, I do know how to love. Mm. Your line, um, the fear, the ache, that this soon will end. Mm -hmm. It's like to encounter beauty and desire reminds us of our finiteness mm -hmm. and our limitedness. And that's what's terrifying. And that's when we are tempted to grasp and to try to possess mm -hmm. so that we don't lose it and so that it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. um, Which is that root of lack of trust that the Lord's going to fill us. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I'm asked to tell my vocation story, because, I mean, I was a super happy Roman Catholic before the Lord asked me to come here. Um, but it was that experience of putting down all the beauties of my Roman life mm -hmm. um, and to wait empty for the Lord to fill me with the beauties of the East, which he did, but it was like slow and gradual. Um, and it's something of that, like we have to trust him enough to renounce all of those lies. The The truth on the other side of all of those lies is you're getting at in your poem, like it's him. Mm -hmm. Like he's the safeguard, not just of the beauty, but of our hearts and our capacity to enter into that beauty. Yeah. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to touch a little bit on the mini topic. <laughs> <laughs> Father Joe, this is for you. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about, because you, this is the reason I came to you and Sister Nupria, both of you would go to the art museum on a retreat day. Um, and I want to know your experience of, of praying with different types of religious art, mm -hmm. particularly, um, I know if you're willing to share this, I know that it was a struggle with you to start praying with icons. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that could be really fruitful for our listeners yeah. to hear. Um, I, I do on occasion go to the art museum for uh, retreat days. She didn't lie about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> though, interestingly, I don't spend most of the time with the religious art other mm -hmm. than that um, Cretan icon of the Theotokos that I spent probably 20, 30 minutes just standing there. But um the Impressionists moved me a lot. Cafe Wepler was my favorite of the Impressionists till they put it in storage recently, which made me really sad. Um, it, it's like this, the warmth inviting you in, um, in from the cold to sit at the table, like in community. So like a lot of um, the secular paintings are, are actually what really moved me. Um, but years ago before I entered, I remember being, the Cleveland Art Museum's just terrific. Mm. Um if you are ever in Cleveland or even like within driving distance, uh, you just go. It's really, really wonderful. Um, but they have this statue. This was after I received, I, I had received my call to a celibate vocation, um, a few years before I even met the nuns at this monastery. So, um, but I was wrestling with through prayer, like coming to terms, I should say with, um, what a life of virginity means like, and, um, they have this statue of Mary that was damaged by the iconoclasts in the French Revolution. And, like, Jesus has been struck out of her arms, like the child Jesus. So it's Mary intact, and then just this ragged stone. Mm -hmm. where. And I stood in the art museum, and I just was like, Lord... That's what your call to me feels like. It feels like this is where your call leads me. Mm -hmm. To have this part of me struck away and to be here empty and rough and incomplete. And it was really important for me to be pierced like that so that I was able to... Because at that point, I was still... Um, I was confused. I was feeling guilty. Like, you're not supposed to... I thought, this is totally not true, you're not supposed to grieve sacrifices of love. Well, no, you are. That's part of the sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I was young. I didn't quite understand that. Um, 
And so those sorts of things, um, there's one I really like of Jesus with his, their, the angle of their necks looks very uncomfortable. Um, Jesus has his arm just around John and he just has his neck bent at like a 45 degree angle. <laughs> and there's just this statue and they just have these kind of, um, I don't know, kind of weird smiles on their face, but there's something about that. That's like, I want to be, I want to be, um, drawn to Christ's mm-hmm. shoulder by him. Um, but by and large at the, at the art museum, um, what moves me it like they have great religious art um but it's more interesting than prayerful my favorite religious image so like i didn't grow up praying with religious imagery at all protestant um and and honestly all of the depictions we had i just found kind of ghastly and effeminate like you know just yeah i was not <laughs> i was not a fan of of the few um so uh, 2012 I've been Catholic for three years, I guess. Um, I was in a Catholic bookstore. I'd never been in a Catholic bookstore before. (laughs) And um, there was this painting on the wall of the seven sorrows of Mary, like Mm. the seven swords. And it's funny because um, I've seen other versions of this, and I just find them kind of insipid and washed out in that sort of Italian-esque piety that does not move me but this one particularly like mary's face is pale she has tear tracks on her face she's cradling in her hands very gently the nails and the crown of thorns but they're at the bottom of the picture and she just has this heart using blood as these swords and i was going through a heartbreak at the time and i rounded the corner i saw this picture and i stopped so quickly that i literally almost fell over um my momentum was just I just utterly still and I'm just looking at her and what came up in my heart was you know what that feels like Mm. like I was seeing mirrored to me what my my own chest felt like day in and day out at that point in my life um from this great heartache and so I was poor but I bought it and I prayed with that until I entered I gave it to my friends Gina and Brian um who were companions in, in suffering in some ways. And so at that point I started, I I had, um, one year for Christmas, my parents gave me Michelangelo's Pieta. And I prayed with that as I was coming to enter the monastery, like recognizing it's not just, I'm offering, like, this is what my parents are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I gave that to my mom, my last Christmas at home. Um, so so praying with with those sorts of art um the pieta is actually one of the pieces of art yes. that has moved me very deeply did you when you i at, prayed with that on retreat i was just going to ask yep. at latrobe and the mausoleum they have a really yes. good replica i sat there for like yes. an entire holy hour and just prayed with that statue and nobody will bother you unlike nope. saint peter's you can just sit there mm-hmm. and let that not a single person came in as i was yeah your heart mm-hmm. um and so I, think I just, the way I just like just, sat in front of that and wept. <laughs> yes, I did when I was there too. Um, it's just like these things are giving us permission mm-hmm. to be human. Mary particularly is giving us permission, which is why the parish, I will leave it unnamed, that I attended in grad school. Um, <laughs> I would always sit on the Joseph side of this church because the painting on the Mary side it, apparently, it's like this um, famous, very famous Spanish painting. I don't really like Spanish art, apparently. But um, she just, like, has her hands clasped, and she's on a cloud, and she's looking up just, like, as though she has no agency, no human feeling, almost like she's drugged. It's just mm-hmm. horrific to me. Um, but in the in the depictions of her suffering, I feel like she gives us permission to be fully human with all of our... She, like, shatters the myth that love insulates us from pain. Mm. And she helps us recognize that to surrender to love actually opens us to pain. Mm -hmm. And that this is good. Like, this is right, I should say. Um, Pain is never a good. Um, So, I don't know. Does that answer that part of the question? It does. Icons? Yeah. Um, I really struggled with icons. Um, I where I was on a course with Bill Donahue, um, called the Way of Beauty several years ago, and he made a point that through the theology of the body institute, yeah, yeah, 
he made a point that um, we need an aesthetic education. Or I think he said aesthetic formation. And that really struck me because, like, we talk about catechesis, but we don't talk about how to, like, raise our children to know what is good and true and beautiful to like, especially in the beautiful, we want them to know it's true. We want them to know it's good, but with beauty, it's sort of like, well, whatever you think. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I needed aesthetic formation in the East. So I was very, um, troubled for a long time. I, when I first came to the monastery, I went home and I bought a Henry Nguyen book on, uh, icons, praying with icons. It wasn't really helpful. Um, to be honest, but the, um, Hermione, right? I just want to, like, give me the book that'll teach me to do this thing, right? Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. Um, so I would sit in my icon corner, and I would just try to, like, have some kind of emotional experience. But I like, had none. Just none. And um, this kind of bothered me because it makes me not a good nun, right? Like, we have icon corners. <laughs> um, finally, I talked about in spiritual At least direction. a Byzantine nun. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so I talked about in spiritual direction. My spiritual father, um, was also Protestant and then Roman Catholic before he became a Byzantine priest. And so, um, that's been very helpful for me in many ways. Um, so I brought this to him because I wasn't about to admit it to anybody else. Um, I was too proud. And I was just like, can we just talk about icons? Because it's just not working. Like I just got, (laughs) there's just nothing. Like I'm totally flat. It's like nothing's happening. Well, he asked me a question that kind of took me off guard, (laughs) Um, have you had your icons blessed? Yeah. No, like, have you had the, um, Byzantine blessing from the, what do we call it then? The Trebnik? Um, the, um. Great Euclidean? Yeah, or the Trebnik. Um. Yeah. Like, have they been blessed this way? Well, no. So I slowly started taking all the ones from my cell. Euclidean. From the altar. That's it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, what happened was, as I listened to the priest bless them, the prayer formed in me how to pray with this Mm. icon. It's talking about the incarnation. It's talking about the transfiguration and the ascension. Like, we are able to paint icons because God became man and our humanity is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's talking about, it says, like, give all who pray before them healing healing may all um may have the power to dispel diabolical errors Mm -hmm. and what i slowly came to realize is that unlike other art even religious art the icon is a place of presence Mm. and and the only thing that i can this isn't a perfect analogy obviously but it's the only thing i can kind of an only analogy that might suffice as Christ is present in the tabernacle, present in the Eucharist. Um, After an icon is blessed, this becomes a portal through which I encounter the presence of the saint. This is no longer a picture of the saint. It's not like a picture of our family, right, that's putting you in mind of them. They are in some mystical, humble, incarnated way choosing in their love for me to be present to me. Well, that suddenly changed. I should say gradually changed how I prayed with these icons because now they're becoming relational. Like other art is relational. Um, And it's not just like, oh, I have to go there to speak to them. You can speak to Jesus when you're not in the chapel, right? Um, I don't have very, uh, I can't articulate very much what this means because it's something I experience. It's a mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, I would really encourage people, maybe, I don't know if you can link it in the show notes, um, the prayer from the Great Eulogian. Mm-hmm. Whenever I am um, Beth works wonders icon, when <laughs> Whenever I give an icon to somebody, if it's not blessed here, I print out the prayer so mm-hmm. they can have a priest use it because I think this really does matter. Um, so to... What do you do with somebody that you love? You sit in their presence. Like, you and I have just been in the same room doing work together on purpose. Like, gone to the same place to do work together and not been able to, like, talk. Mm -hmm. um, But just to enjoy being with each other, right? Mm -hmm. To just rest before our saint friends um, is a really powerful thing. At our profession, what the bishop said, um, remember the martyrs. Mm. 
that was a really powerful moment for me in which I was aware of my particular saints surrounding me, um, standing with me, like an assurance from them that they would stay with me to the end and bring mm-hmm. me to the glory of God that they were experiencing. So like to really surround ourselves with the saints, which is what we're doing in icons. Um, but we have a role in that, which is to be attentive to them. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my friends was in a religious community for a few years and they had this practice Roman community. I think this is really beautiful. When they entered their cell, they would always make the sign of the cross um, to do this. When we pass the icon corner in our cell, um, because he's there mm-hmm. in a particular way because of the icons, right? Um, you know, what's funny is, um, I've just always done that. And, hmm, that's um, but what's funny is I you just moved cells did. this past weekend. And when I was in my old cell to get stuff out of it, when I crossed in front of where my icon corner used to be, I made the sign of the cross <laughs> and I was like, there's not an icon corner here anymore. Um, and I was like, well, but I mean... I don't know. There's still probably a, some presence there of, yeah, anyways. But, <laughs> it's haunted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good so haunting. I hope that answers Father, uh, Father Joe's questions. I'm sure it does. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. You and I, um, I think you maybe already have a prayer intention in mind, but if not, now is the time to think of one while I give um, our spiel. Uh, Father Michael does a much better job of this. I'm not great at it. Uh, but we are on all of the, um, social media platforms and, um, mm, Twitter is just Father Michael at Padre Michael O. Um, otherwise what God is not is on all of the things. We're also on Goodreads. Um, our media team does a great job of managing that. And there's lots of good discussions that happen there about the books that we're reading and the books that you're reading. So check that out. Uh, we're on YouTube audio only. And um, you can support us on Patreon if you want to support Fotina, the nonprofit that uh, Father Michael and I run, that we um, use the funds to support this podcast, but also to, um, to serve the poor and tithe to our churches uh, and support other Christian evangelization. Um, yeah, there's, I don't know, that wasn't a great job. Sorry, media team. I am I know that I'm terrible at that. Uh, but before, actually, before we give our prayer intentions, I just remembered, Mother Petra, there is um, one other quote that I'd like you to share from Weight of Glory that I think is a, a good wrap-up that, that refocuses on the, um, the eternal that our ache points towards. So if you are willing to read that. Um, and while you do that, I will also think of my prayer intention. In one way, of course, God has given us the morning star already. Morning stars capitalized. That's important. You can go and enjoy the gift on many fine mornings. If you get up early enough, what more you may ask, do we want? Ah, but we want so much more. Something the books on aesthetics take little notice of. But the poets and the mythologies know all about it. We do not want merely to see beauty, though. God knows even that is bounty enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words. To be united with the beauty we see. To pass into it. To receive it into ourselves. To bathe in it. To become part of it. This is why we have peopled air and earth and water with gods and goddesses and nymphs and elves, that though we cannot, yet these projections can enjoy in themselves that beauty, grace, and power of which, of which nature is the image. That is why the poets tell us such lovely falsehoods. They talk as if the west wind could really sweep into a human soul, but it can't. They tell us that beauty born of murmuring sound will pass into a human face, but it won't, or not yet. For if we take the imagery of scripture seriously, if we believe that God will one day give us the morning star and cause us to put on the splendor of the sun, then we may surmise that both the ancient myths and the modern poetry, so false as history, may be, may be very near the truth as prophecy. At present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of morning, 
but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see. But all the leaves of the New Testament are wrestling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Thank you. Um, I think I just want to leave that with our listeners too. Um, yeah, to pray with. Feel free to, to rewind and listen to that again and um, just open up that ache and know that the Lord is promising to fulfill that ache in eternity. Um, and we really lean into that promise. <laughs> um, we're, we staked our lives on it. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Um, okay. Uh, prayer intentions. I would like to pray for my nephew, Angelo, um, who is a soul in whom I see so much beauty and, um, and yeah, I just ask that you pray for him that he can also, as he grows older, come to see that beauty in himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mother Petra? Um, I would ask that you would pray for my friends Gina and Brian McCauley. Um, they have a, well, I guess Benny's three now. Um, Brian has uh, terminal brain cancer, and they are embracing their cross these days um, with so much love and it's so wearing Um, for years they've been an image to me of the fruitfulness and the beauty of suffering Mm -hmm. long before this diagnosis came Um, just the fruit in the church from their faithfulness to each other through um, some really difficult times Um, and I've been so moved like they they're giving me a picture and their readiness of surrender that's costing everything um and embracing the gift of today of what my life as a monastic is supposed to be um so i ask that you would all pray for them um for uh, encouragement and deeper love and faithfulness as they walk this path together thank you thank you Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I know you don't fun. like giving talks, and it was great. <laughs> well, at least there's not an audience this time that I can see. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, there are plenty of people listening, though. <laughs> um, but I love you a lot, and mm-hmm. I know that you know that. So, All right. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the gift of this day, for the gift of my sister, Mother Petra. Thank you for the ways in which you have helped the two of us to encourage one another to dive deeper into beauty, to be open to beauty, to be open to ache. I ask that you grant Mother Petra, myself, and our listeners an openness to long and to ache, but even more importantly, to turn to you in that longing and in that aching, to know that Union with you is what they are really aching for. I ask that you bestow so much grace, your love, your healing upon Angelo, Brian, Gina, Benny, and all of those that are listeners are holding in their hearts up to you. Please give us courage in this journey, in this exile, until we reach our homeland in your kingdom. I ask all of this through the prayers of St. Peter, St. Nathaniel. Blessed friends, Jaeger's daughter. Jaeger's daughter. He's a blessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Blessed Pier Giorgio. St. Michael. St. Therese. St. Mary Magdalene. St. Mary of Egypt. Our Anglican Jack, if we're allowed. Our Anglican Jack, if we're allowed. <laughs> 
the most holy Theotokos, and all the saints, and through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen.